welcome to our conference, uh, Thinking Food. Uh, we conceived this conference about a year ago, and uh, we've been working on this uh, since. Um, and uh, me and, uh, and Ona Kakareko and Marta Ushukniewicz, this is the organizing team, but this is really not everybody who made this work and made it possible. Uh, our wonderful students uh, from our course, BA course in Food Studies, are with us and uh, they've been working very hard to uh, cope with the organizational side of the event. So welcome to this conference, enjoy the film. We are looking forward to the discussions about uh, food studies and everything related today and tomorrow and I hope you'll stay with us at the very end of the conference. Uh, the opening panel is today and then we have a very exciting uh, closing panel on Hamburger Revolution in Warsaw. Uh, we're talking about meat, and not only meat, also about veganism, um, tomorrow, but uh, this is tomorrow, let's enjoy today. Um, so here is the film for you, and after that I have an exciting discussion. Um, then we have the first uh, parallel panels, and after parallel panels we invite everybody to join us at the uh, reception that is also being prepared now by our students. So, uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining us and uh, enjoy the film. We'd like to start with a little bit uh, about the film. Uh, Wes Anderson's film is uh, probably, well, I don't know if you've seen it before, but this is one of my favorites. Um, Anderson uh, works on his films for several years on each one. And so this one is uh, from what, 2009, I suppose. And so um, after that, you can call this was his renaissance. Uh, before he was making films uh, that were called more independent films, you could call them. But afterwards, uh, he also uh, did, apart from the short films, uh, Moonrise Kingdom and Grand Budapest Hotel that opened this year's early now. So this is the biggest league you can ever get. Um, and this is also uh, not really an ordinary film, as you see, because, well, this is not really an animation, this is not a cartoon, this is uh, done in a very specific technique of making a film, and it's not really for kids. Uh, so, to start off our discussion about the film and its um, contexts, uh, many, because as you probably know, Wes Anderson's films uh, have plenty of context behind them, the history behind them. We'd like to talk to our guests at first about the impressions of the film. What, uh, what, uh, what kind of um, maybe cultural traits do you see? What kind of um, connection to the food that we, we noticed during the screening? So I can start um, by saying that for me, um, the movie was particularly interesting as far as gender roles were concerned and food especially in the opening scene when we see the family around the table and that's the mother who presents and serves breakfast to the father who's just reading the newspaper and that doesn't take care about food in general and the fact that um, the food that they are having uh, we can call a typical middle class breakfast and another thing that resembles um, typical middle class is the fact that he's saying, oh, I feel poor. So for me, that was really striking, that these two things go really together, like being middle class, having middle class food, and this profound feeling of being too poor, so being aspiring all the time. Mm -hmm. well, what I found interesting was the fact that uh, at some point, uh, is it on? I am. <laughs> yes. So um, at, at some point, uh, fantastic Mr. Fox says, I don't want to live in a hole, right? But I can show it. Uh, I, I don't want to live in a hole, right? He wants to move into a tree. And this is, he tries to achieve his social ascent through stealing of food, right? Of three mean uh, capitalists, right? So we've got bodies, buns, and beans. Competitive capitalists who are rich, who are greedy, who represent this disgusting, villainous uh, aspect of, of capitalism, right? And we've got this individual that tries to fight with the corporate 
let's say America representing, right? Three different. Uh, so we've got chicken farmer, goose farmer, and uh, the uh, the cider mm -hmm. uh, manufacturer, right? So this was interesting that he's trying to achieve social assent through confronting capitalists and uh, as if doing that through the illegal means, let's yeah. say. So that was interesting for me. Yeah, that's thing. very interesting, but the ending shows that he's kind of accepting this. It's still subversive in a way because he's, um, he's stealing steel but from the supermarket and he's And he's the supermarket is owned and by, by three, yeah. by the well, three bees. bees. He's enjoying bees. bees. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, as a mm -hmm. place for entertainment. Mm -hmm. And the, the movement, when you look at uh, the fact that uh, at the beginning we've got this generic uh, breakfast that represents middle class America, the 1950s, mm -hmm. right? The quintessential 1950s, right? And uh, then um, the end, we've got the final, let's say, meal, celebration of food, right? They have in the store something that is connected with artificiality, with processed food, mm -hmm. something that um, when they were trying to steal something, it was. Uh, organic, let's say, right? It was natural, and then they have to uh, they have to make do with uh, with whatever they can find in the supermarket. So instead of apples, we've got apple juice, mm -hmm. and it's interesting. I don't know if you know that uh, a month or two months ago, FDA uh, lowered the legal amount of arsenic that is added to each apple juice you can buy in the states. So all apple juices contain arsenic. So this is. On the one hand, you've got apples, right? And then you've got apple juice with arsenic. So, you know, we've, we've got the risk of GMO, you've got processed foods and all possible contaminations connected with civilization, right? So, as you can see, I think that this is the, the ability, not only of humans, but also of animals, right? So he pre represents this ability to adjust, right? His dietary habits to whatever is at hand, right? So it's actually not a critique, but some kind of... I mean, this is just a statement, right? On how we, how well we can adapt. I mean, animals and, and humans, right? Or how we are forced to adapt, actually. Because mm -hmm. that was not their free choice to start mm -hmm. going to the supermarket. But they were forced to do that. Either mm -hmm. we stay underground and we listen to our children saying in repeating I'm hungry and hungry all the time or we are trying to get over that so we go to a supermarket and get whatever is accessible. Mm -hmm. So maybe some kind of um, crisis narrative because it was made after 2007. So maybe mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Connected with reception you mean? Yeah, in a way, in his sense. he's trying to buy a house but he's sense. losing his house. Yes, right. yeah, foreclosure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, in a sense, we've got this social ascent when he moves into the house, and the first shot that we have of Felicity, she's vacuuming the floor in the kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. And so everything seems that they're on the way to happily ever after, but then there are complications, as always in life, like obstacles, and there's this descent to uh, supermarket, to fluorescent lights, artificiality, processed food, something that doesn't seem to be too healthy, right? So we don't have that much of organic food. That was at the beginning. Yeah. We've got this first thing. Yes, yes. Eden or something. Yes. Like yes. Eden or something. Mm -hmm. And here it's it's quite the opposite. It's just mm -hmm. this is what if if you've got if you think about people nowadays the trend is to embrace organic food waste, right? Healthy lifestyle. This would be the opposite. Mm -hmm. They're forced to do the opposite, right? Yeah. In the end, they are actually going for the processed food because mm -hmm. it's available in the supermarket because they don't have anything else to cook. Right. So this mm -hmm. is like. Or finished mm -hmm. organic. But isn't that a comment, a very powerful comment on the social situation in the States? The vast majority of people, uh, of Americans that are um, um, standing in those lines for, the, you know, the poor, waiting for the soup to be handed over to them, they cannot afford organic food. Right? Probably, but, but yeah. still aspiring middle class goes to Whole Foods yeah. yes. and opts for yes. organic. Yes. Yes. And strongly disagrees with this capitalistic vision of processed food and, and not doing shopping at Walmart and that yeah. stuff. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a populist movie because, like, Mr. Fox doesn't he doesn't do a big deal out of this situation. Mm -hmm. like for him, for him, it's normal that now we have this juice and this. Well, he seems to be kind of satisfied with everything that comes, right? I mean, he, he yeah. seems to be like, oh, we are too poor, but actually, at the beginning, he doesn't do anything to do that. Then he takes a loan, he buys a, ha buys a house in the tree, and then it's the, this is the, the beginning of the end, right? Because he's not focused on food in general, but on stealing. Yeah. He's focused on survival. On survival. 
survival risk mm -hmm. uh, Let's switch uh, our perspective a little bit because this is thinking food. So we are talking food, but I would like also to talk about uh, this film as a starting point to actually talking about um, the actual food, the recipes, the things that foxes eat, oh, like the things they prepare. <laughs> Um, the celebration of food and uh, you know around the table, the, uh, the celebration of being together uh, and eating together. Uh, so of course we we have started with these female roles um, uh, that you've touched upon. But I would also like uh, to ask you, Magda, uh, since you have prepared and photographed so many nice things on your blog and not only on your blog, uh, have you noticed anything particular in the film? Like roasted turkey, <laughs> like roasted turkey, <laughs> or yes. cake full of fruit falling apart, yeah. mm. uh, and mm, nutmeg ginger snap apple cookies. Of yes. course, yes, mm. still warm, still warm, and very <laughs> fragrant and appealing. Okay, so this is because I well I wouldn't call this movie a foodie movie, and this is what I, we, we probably are also surprised by, but. Um, I've read actually numerous um, reviews and people were actually calling it a foodie movie, so I was just thinking in what way, and this is I think also a good starting point for our next topic. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you say so? Would you say it's, it's, a, it's, it's a movie about the celebration of eating? Also, perhaps. For me, it's more like conscious eating than celebration of eating. Mm -hmm. Like if you go into detail and you want to analyze the movie um, more profoundly, it turns out that it's about conscious decisions. What to procure food. Yeah, and, and that's about being a foodie in general. Like, I don't read this movie as a foodie movie just to see the celebrations, because they are all the time interrupted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was pretty surprised when I saw that the, I thought like big night would be the opening, grand opening, right? This is like the celebration of food yes. that you get. Yes. I suppose that you know many people know the movie, but uh, but there is the point that um, when you said that the celebrations are interrupted, so maybe that's the point that they cannot, they seem not to communicate, right? Mm -hmm. He has got so many secrets at the beginning. Uh, he is acting against his nature when uh, Felicity asks him to stop seeding uh, chickens, right? So this is, uh, somehow it's the, the outcome is predictable because you cannot really deny your true nature, right? So in a sense, whatever happens after that, whatever conversation, I mean, the, the conversation they've got, uh, the first meal, when they, they, they've got breakfast, right? <laughs> so, middle class gender breakfast. Well, do you remember how the mother responded to her son, to Ash, saying, I won't go to, yes, you will. I mean, no, you won't. I and this, you know, I've got, you, yeah, no, yeah. you don't, you don't have fever, right? So this is like um, this inability to talk to family members, and it somehow is uh, uh, also extends to the relations in the, in the community itself, right? When the beavers come and etc. so that there's this confrontation that I asked you for dinner and then Mr. Fox tries to steal the show, so there is this power struggle, right? So th there's this kind of inability to finish their meals together, such as somehow that there is this conflict. Yeah, person, they eat in an animal way, like yeah. it's not yes. 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 It's yes. incredible. Mm -hmm. You cannot feast yeah. in, in this way. Mm -hmm. on, on the one hand, they are uh, preparing food, right? So, you know, delicate things, and they are just putting it all together really neatly, and then they eat like that, like, mm -hmm. you know, wild animals. So this is the true nature of this. For me, the, maybe the foodie aspect of the movie is the fact that, for example, um, a rabbit is Mario Batelli. Who is a well-known Food Network star? <laughs> and if you have ever seen any of these shows, and you see the actual rabbit, then you're like, "Wow, this is real Mario Batali." But if you have never had any contact with that person, then you're like, "Okay, this is just a rabbit." rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Who is also? Um, I think he's praying before going to battle. Yeah. Yes. This is, yes. This is the Mario Batali also. Mm -hmm. Point. Why? So. Uh, like a short note, if somebody doesn't know who Mario Batali is, he's the Iron Chef of America and there is a huge contest and they are battling on a stage, so before going on a stage, um, he prays. So that's just that's the thing. That's the thing. But and if you've seen that, then you actually notice. And you recognize him before yeah. going to battle, right? 
And I think that in the movie there is implicitly a question uh, asked, uh, what can be eaten and what should not be eaten. Mm -hmm. For example, it's, it's strange because these are animals and, I for think. example, we eat rabbits, some of us, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's this funny question, like, uh, foxes can eat everything, but nobody eats foxes. I think it's... I, I think that the, the foxes, uh, fox as a as a species, animal species, is a, is a, a it has got a symbolical, complicated meaning. Uh, on the one hand, it's the sporting foe. It's the uh, when you've got hound hunting, right? Uh, fox hunting with hounds, right? And then on the other hand, we've got uh, fox as a cunning creature, right? Uh, a cunning. Um, um, or you've got a, a fox as a, as a pest, right? So the way we are presented, uh, the, the, the uh, perspective of Mr. Fox, it's like he's over-intellectual, he's over-thinking a lot, he is over-complicating situations, he plays over, a lot of over, mm -hmm. right? In, uh, but from the perspective of the, the three Bs that we have, he is the pest, he is the vermin that has to be eradicated, right? So. Um, the, the, so we've got two completely different perspectives as, a, uh, as an enemy, right? And uh, uh, some, some, somebody, right, who is uh, too clever, right, to live in a hole. I also have a question because um, here we have a juxtaposition of the three bees mm -hmm. um, who are eating just one thing, right? just one yes. item all the time. Pretty gross, I would say, that donuts with Liver, uh, liver fat, liver fat yes, yes or injected inside or something, and uh, at the same time we have a family of foxes and other animals who are eating pretty decent things, at least regular, they prepare food, food. kind of regular. Mm -hmm. oh, so um, I was just thinking, if you know, judging by this juxtaposition, can we say that um, is this a symbol of what kind of people or animals we are? I mean, the, the, the foods we eat. Judging by the, or or maybe how is the appreciation of food as such, you know, um, important to, to people or creatures being kind of civilized? So, um, so if food determines who we are, kind of, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, can can we just you know get this kind of um, end end note to to yeah, no. even at the simple level, one of these characters yeah. is. Uh, green. <laughs> because green is right, yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what I found more interesting is that they've got British accents. Yeah. Yeah. All of them. All, all of them. So they, they, they as if represent this, uh, you know, old continent capitalist, uh, you know, capitalist villains, right? And we've got the individual, you know, the, the romantic individual in America yeah. trying yeah. to fuck them, yeah. you know, winning in the all end, them stealing them from them. them. Yes. All of them. Yes. Like Meryl Street, George Clooney. Yes. Yeah. All yes. The yes. Yes. Anderson stuff. Mm -hmm. so, but maybe this movie like, takes place in not in not in America. Yeah. yeah. Especially. Yeah. yeah. The set the setting is like, yeah. it's, it's like English, English, right. English English for example, yeah. like or beagles, mixed with right, like some yes. American traits. Yeah. Yes. If you think about you know fox hunting with beagles yeah. or something, yes. then that would be that would be British. Mm -hmm. Although they don't drink any tea. No, yeah. cider. Cider. Cider is also but cider is more British. Yes, yeah. American. So. Um, right. But if food determines who yes. we are, or we determine <laughs> what we eat, yes, I think that there have been so much research going on on that, including you know, class, gender, and aspirations, that mm -hmm. we cannot overlook that. And on one can hand, can you hear? Excuse me. Yeah, the no, can you just point it? Oh, for the record. Oh, oh. oh. so <laughs> I'm sorry. You really don't good. like it. Please. So, first thing is what you actually can afford, and the second thing, what you want to eat to feel better, and what you aspire to do. It's similar to what we have now in Warsaw with all this slow food movement. Like, if people truly believe in you know the quality and supporting local farmers and so on and if people would like to be part of a certain group mm -hmm. and i think that in this movie it's also obvious that mm -hmm. three bees mm -hmm. would like to belong to one group of people like they're producers so they are proud of their product mm -hmm. and they just completely ignore other things 
with this, the second uh, viewing of the movie, I, I noticed that Felicity has got this hippie band on her hand, on her hand, right? And you notice right. it on the first time. And again, kind of suggesting counterculture, right? Mm -hmm. Some when you've got three Bs, that would be the mainstream, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, products that could be yeah. offered, let's say, in Walmart. Yeah. And then we would have uh, the foxes, right? That are uh, the alternative movement to whatever America is fed with, them, right? <laughs> There's this guitar singer who's yes. like, yes. like yes. Jarvis kind of counterculture yes. Yes. song. Yes, yes, yes. He's of course mocked by the capitalists. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. 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 Mm -hmm. And I want to ask about meat obsession. Like, yeah, I think this, this movie is uh, in a way about meat and how she's perceived it. Maybe there's some kind of vegetarian subtext, I don't know. But uh, for example, this is the, the worst guy? No, this. The fattest one. Mm -hmm. Boggies. Boggies. Uh -huh. He's, He's like 12, 9, 9 chicken. 12, 12 chickens a day. That, that is a lot, lot of chickens. <laughs> I mean, for a whole family, then just one person. But the interesting thing is that, well, okay, Boggies, he weighs uh, 340 pounds. That's like a hippopotamus, right? Rhinoceros. Rhinoceros, sorry, rhinoceros. And he actually looks like one. And 12 chickens a day. And Bounce, uh, it's this uh, uh, goose liver fat injected into donuts, was it? Yeah. Donuts. Yeah, kind of something, right? Which is gross. And uh, and then you've got Bean, the, the one that is the scariest man alive. And he doesn't eat meat. He's the vegetarian. He he's eat on anything. liquid diet. He's on liquid diet, right? So he's, <laughs> he's an alcoholic. He's an alcoholic. <laughs> he doesn't eat, right. Uh, so he doesn't eat anything, let alone he doesn't eat uh, meat, right? So uh, could that be a comment? I mean, because if, if you've got, uh, you know, um, um, bogies and bounds, the ones that are interested in meat and they are producing meat and they are selling meat, so maybe making money meat. And alcohol is even worse than meat. But because he produces turkey, right? And cider. Yes. So he chooses the best quality. <laughs> Possibly. Maybe he knows something about the GMO or something. Um, right. Let me also, um, because, you know, I think that some of you may be huge fans of Wes Anderson's films. I think I've mentioned it more than once now already. But <laughs> I, uh, you know, watching Anderson's films, um, you always have comfort food. I mean, uh, like, I, I even have some, some quotes from the films, like, uh, you have in Rushmore, you have Fisher, uh, Fisher's Thanksgiving uh, TV dinner, you have Royal Tenenbaum's burger while he's in hospital, and he shouldn't eat burgers, right? Here you have some comfort food, because when they are, you know, somewhere in the hall, they, they have this huge last supper together before mm -hmm. they're interrupted. Would you say that in this movie, there is comfort in food, or in Anderson's films, there is comfort in food. Do you find comfort in food? <laughs> okay, so well, I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> yes, I would say there is comfort in food, especially that they arrange this huge dinner together mm -hmm. in order to celebrate their freedom, mm -hmm. and food is part of that. And it's also always part of huge celebrations in all the cultures, mm -hmm. like weddings, baptism, or any introduction to the mm -hmm. society or small group of people. There is always some food. So food had also conveys the symbol of being together, feeding people. By feeding, you convey social meaning, emotions, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think for everyone, Comfort food, comfort food is food um, that you associate with certain positive emotions, mm -hmm. like you know what your grandma used to cook, what your mom used to make when you had flu or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's also present in that movie. They have this turkey and cranberry sauce, as I remember from the table. Um, so for me, this is something typical for Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. cultures to have roasted turkey mm -hmm. and cranberry, especially for Americans, mm -hmm. who have a really strong feelings toward turkey, even mm -hmm. if they don't <laughs> like eating all the time. Yes, and um, uh, whenever in distress, people eat or overeat, right? And uh, they, they try to compensate 
for whatever psychological problems they have. Mm -hmm. uh, some people overeat and some deny food mm -hmm. for themselves, right? So, but in, in here in the movie, we don't have this, you know, you, you've got a, a physical hunger, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can have a psychological one, they connect with emotions or, you know, stress situation or something. Mm -hmm. So can we say that the final one is just for physical hunger and uh, the, the, the last supper, let's say, let's call it, the one that is interrupted, which is actually a huge feast. And, and I mean, everybody, and this is the only moment when, where everybody in the film is participating in the production, right? Yeah. Uh, in serving, right? And later on, uh, the way they are seated at the table. So this is, uh, this is uh, comfort food for their soul, for their sense of belonging, unity, right? That finally they manage to somehow talk to each other and overcome the, the obstacles that are the three Bs, right? And suddenly there's glamour there. Just, yes, yeah. yes, the, and, and the, the decor, it's just mm -hmm. magnificent, right? It doesn't look like a hole in the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Generally, right, tailored clothes and everything that's measured very well in the, you know, everything in the, in the rooms also, if you notice. I, I noticed myself that Wes Anderson from that, that film started wearing his corduroy jackets. Like, <laughs> He's looking almost like, like Mr. Like almost really? Really. Very That's incredible. I think it's a, it's a bit of a Hemingway movie in a way. It's like Grace under pressure. In the, in the <laughs> and I think that's the way Anderson operates in mm -hmm. everyday life. Mm -hmm. Um, we've been talking a lot. Uh, we have plenty more, but perhaps uh, some of you has any questions to our distinguished guests before we move to the next. Do you? Don't be shy. We're like very familiar atmosphere here. You can think about it because at first we didn't uh, we didn't see the questions from you coming, but I think that we can allow a few of them so you can think a little bit more, right? Do they yes. Need to be questions or they. Can it be comments? Sure. Anything. <laughs> okay, perfect. Because I was thinking about this and we were talking, or you were talking, who was the foodie in a movie. And I actually think that I would call three Bs, pieces, uh, foodies, because they have something that they love and they, like, this is their passion, this is what they do for a living. And if you can eat chicken every day, for a whole day and make it prepare it in so many ways, it means something. And um, the same, like if you can eat donuts with uh, duck grease because you love duck so much, but this is something very impressive for me. And uh, yeah, and the fox, like when you were talking about slow and fast food, and the one who eats fast is the fox. And um, so, yeah, like. And then also, I, I don't really, I think the movie is like fatal attraction just with different story, but we see that guy, like we see that three pieces are the bad ones, but actually there are people who want, who want to sell food and someone is stealing it from them and they just want to stop this thing. And uh, as we see, it's not that the fox well, first, he doesn't have to steal, mm -hmm. and then he doesn't do it because he loves ducks or chickens so much, he just does it because he's this wild animal. <laughs> and he doesn't care about food because then, as we see, they just go to supermarket, and it doesn't matter if it's the turkey or it's apple juice or it's actual apple. So I think that this is like, because we're talking about the fox, the fox, and I got pretty mad. <laughs> so, yeah. This were my thoughts. Thank you for another perspective. Would you like to comment on that? Comment to comment. Mm -hmm. Meta comment. Probably <laughs> <laughs> um, you. Okay. Any other comment or question? Yes. I can justify this opinion. Have you read the book? Um, because this is based on a book. Yes. And we only know that the ending is different. Of course, it's a completely different story. This is a story about father-son relationship. And the book is very short and it's really cute. And it's about surviving. Mm -hmm. And there, Mr. Fox, star, he steals food because this is his source of food. Mm -hmm. And uh, those uh, greedy farmers, they try to take everything from him. And there is really this 
power struggle and this class struggle because he is really poor and his family is starving without the stealing. And here I completely agree that he does not have to steal. This is just embracing his nature. And he's, he even says, with this, when you have this waterfall, uh, waterfall, yeah? waterfall scene, he says that he likes everybody to be intimidated by him. So it is rather showing that he, he can. Uh, which is really, like, let's say, this is really, this is his thing, yeah, that, that uh, we believe in this kind of character, but he, I, I don't see the struggle here, it's really in the book, but here I think it's just the, how, how to show that I'm the best. Um, so here it's more like delusions of grandeur, whereas in the book it's more about survival or it's about sustenance, survival. right? Exactly, it's about survival. I haven't had a chance to read the, the, the book, so I'll definitely give it a try. Thank you. Thank you for the yes, comment about the, the end. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Just one more thing that the most glowing food and the best looking one is actually made by the wife of one of those bees. And like everyone is just amazed and, you know, slightly their food. So also this, I think, shows that like they are shown as very, very bad people, but I don't think they are because if someone bakes nice it's, the woman, it's the woman who bakes and the men who consume, you know, we don't see them eating anything else, right? They don't eat the, 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 the cookies for weather. Yeah, the, the apple, right. apple snaps. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's the woman that makes them, and but we don't see them eating that. We, we see the Well, just foxes. because fox, foxes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. We need someone cheering for the other side. <laughs> Any of yeah. Okay, yeah, but the, on the other hand, I think uh, that the, those three bees, uh, as they, we call them, uh, don't eat the food with their families. The, that's true that the wife uh, prepares it and it looks beautiful, but I don't think uh, we have any view of uh, tasting it and, and uh, there's no communion right like family yeah. communion nothing like that it's just yeah, producing it's, yes yeah it's okay, just but producing. the only communion that we see or a fox's community like eating food together oh, is they when they have together. to because they just live together uh, but in the main yeah, first scene is he's the only one eating for me in this movie we, we have opposition between uh, producers and consumers. And what happens to uh, those three big bees is um, uh, what happens? Uh, they, produced, uh, th they produce three worst things uh, that uh, the industry produces. Uh, it's uh, goose liver, which is uh, foie gras, mm -hmm. uh, chicken, and some alcohol. Yeah, uh, so we have uh, three most terrible groups of uh, foods that industry produ produces. You, you don't like chicken? I would like uh, to also... Uh, no, I, uh, I have nothing to meet itself, <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, but it is uh, the method uh, right, the, the chicken are and adding and, you know, yeah. okay. Yeah. Producing, they are, like, they are they are produce. kind of, well, not free range, or, but they're but not... Like, organic, healthy, Well, like, they, they are in pretty good condition, uh, the chickens, when we see them, and they're all healthy. Yeah, it's, it's mm, maybe, but uh, <laughs> on the other hand, but why they need helicopter, like, in order to... It looks like a concentration camp, right? I yeah. Mean, <laughs> No, we were here. Yes, and the fox, the, the foxes. On, on the other hand, they are um, like um, evolving consumers from hunter, not really a, a, a person who steals. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a hunter. This is what they do at the beginning, mm -hmm. and in the end, we have the same uh, person in the supermarket. And what happens during the movie is, for me, um, the, the feast is about, let's say, the slow food movement, with, which is uh, destroyed by uh, the, the, the industry. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, that was the, the most impressive to me, that uh, it was a short story, and it showed really uh, the 
uh, the, the whole history of, mm -hmm. of food in, I don't know, a, 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 an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I made a small comment to Marta before the actual discussion that I, this was my second time playing Southern B and it struck me today that they are living underground, it's all greyish and then suddenly they have the supermarket like Polish people in the 90s they didn't have anything and then all of a sudden they have the supermarket with this trashy food but they are so happy that they have so many things to choose from Capitalism, yeah. right? This is this is the image yeah. of capitalism, right? But on the other hand, that's all they have. Like, they don't have anything else. Only the underground. Yeah, they have no choice. Kind yeah. of yeah. strange life. And just a side note: uh, between the, the first breakfast, where Mr. Fox reads a newspaper, and he is basically an absent father, right? In the family. Yeah, this is the fifties. Yeah. Right. So this is the the, the first one, and bef uh, before the uh, last supper, let's say. There is this scene where they eat, uh, Felicity and Mr. Fox eat at one table, and there is a side table mm -hmm. for kids and mm -hmm. for the better, right? Possible, possible, right? So, so this is as if uh, a transition period, right? Yeah, like including, right? Exactly, yeah. it's like including family members, but you know, we are very not there yet, but we are making this effort, right? And then there is this, you know, embracing community, right? Your your friends, family members, and etc and celebrating the, the uh, not only eating the food but also preparing, right? That's what unites them. So this is just a side note. Mm -hmm. uh, any more comments or questions from you guys? So maybe I want to ask you personally, what do you think? Where's the, um, uh, the, what's the difference between the food trend or food snobbism in a way? Like, where is this boundary? Nowadays in Poland, for example, what's what's natural? Like slow food movement is, as you said, it's like for the privileged people or it's for everyone? How does it look like from your perspective? I can I, I can tell you from the perspective of Lublin, which is a much smaller mm -hmm. city than Warsaw, and uh, and different food maybe in a way. Yes, we 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 don't have so many slow food restaurants actually. Uh, there is some sushi, some Asian food, and you know. Uh, Italian restaurants, but it's not, they are not that popular because of, again, because of the unemployment rate and the, and the mm -hmm. financial situation. So uh, I think that it's more connected with bigger cities than the um, mm -hmm. And uh, But I think that the, the, uh, it's, it's, uh, we can see the beginnings of right, mm -hmm. the restaurants. But. To me, the slow food snobism, and perhaps the other snobism, yeah. starts <laughs> when on Monday you go to McDonald's or you eat kebab. That's where you can detect if somebody goes uh, shopping uh, to the farmer's market because he or she feels truly responsible for the food intake mm -hmm. or whether this person goes there for some social reasons because on Monday he or she comes back to some chain restaurants, quote unquote. Do you think kebabs are very bad? Well, they're tasty, but not the healthiest option, right? So, but maybe so. Maybe it's slow food. Some days and a holiday, and you cannot afford it like every day. Um, I personally think that um, if you want to eat local, you can do it on a low cost, but you have to do it at home. Mm -hmm. If you want to have cheaper stuff available, or steal from it. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had just one more comment because there, there was this um, uh, scene where um, uh, Mr. Fox had this existential problems like, who am I, right? Where am I, uh, a fox, not a horse, right? And I found it really, really interesting that it's the fox here because, again, this symbolical, complicated image that we have. And he, again, as if, as if refers, uh, this is uh, as a point of reference to our identity crisis that we have, like now is what should we eat, right? Is it a social stance, right? If we do this, if we buy a local market, etc. So as if the, his existential dilemmas reflect our dilemmas at the beginning of the 20th century, that again, what you eat defines who you are, basically. So I just wonder if this film was influenced by those critical documentaries about food. Anderson is like, he's very peculiar director, and we cannot mm -hmm. Tell it for sure, but mm -hmm. it looks like it's 
maybe it in was, a way. It was already after food ink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was already after food matters. And and super size. Super, super size. Right. Probably. So again, the, 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 it might have been like a conscious decision to include this mm -hmm. uh, debate over GMO, over processed foods, mm -hmm. right, over conscious right eating. Mm -hmm. and so after all, it's not just about survival, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But just one more comment, um, because this is not a very typical film. I mean, it was chosen very uh, carefully by by the organized <laughs> committee, because we have lots of things to discuss here. But also, if you notice the, the technique in which it was made, the the right the stop motion kind of it's not really a cartoon. If you if you see. Um, all the tiny details. I think you would need also more viewings of the film, more screenings, because you know after four, five times, I notice some also tiny details here, like you mentioned the Felicity's headband, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think this kind of technique? What kind of effect does it have on the viewer? Does it change a little bit um, how you how you see the film, how you see the story behind it? The way you know the way in which it's made. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we, we can draw a parallel between um, Fantastic Mr. Fox and Cloud with a Chance of Meatballs. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you had a chance to read the book itself. Book. Again, completely different. Just the cover. Yeah. It's it's the, the, the it's, um, so it's it's a. Um, the, the message is slightly different here, like with the ending changes a lot, right, in mm -hmm. Fantastic Mr. Fox. Uh, and uh, in case of uh, Cloudy with Chance of Meatballs, the, sec the sequel also mm -hmm. adds a lot, and, and uh, uh, the, the perspective is different in the literary original. But what I'm trying to say is that when you've got uh, computer animated movies, um, they're nice to watch, especially nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, with, this, uh, with this image that Anderson used, um, it's more real. You can you can visualize it, right? You can you can you can almost taste it, mm -hmm. right? So I, I was probably a very conscious choice, and that was a very good choice to mm -hmm. to, to do that, right? Especially cookies, yes, <laughs> and waffles, <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you also you know the colors in there. Also, we we were talking during the film that in the beginning it's all caramel like. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like toffee stuff. Yeah, it's toffee. <laughs> Um, and later, also, you know, the, the clothes. Of course, we mentioned the tie of the of the lawyer was always in the in the tie, you know. And only when there's a disaster coming, he's just you know loosening it up. So there are just yeah, as I mentioned, tiny details. On me, it has plenty of effect. Yeah, we don't. I just wonder how do they make these cookies, for example, because like it's, it's these are miniatures, so mm -hmm. yeah, small, tiny cookies, yeah. and probably they have some great. Any more uh, comments or questions from our dear audience? Yes. If I can. Um, I was thinking um, to what you said about the visual aspect of the film. Um, there is something about Wes Anderson's meticulous depiction of reality that you know it's like very precise and very pretty to look at. I mean, the, 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 there's this pleasure in looking at a nice thing. Which is similar, and it's not a very, maybe a very good analogy, but a bit like food porn. You know, you have or this. Hannibal. Pardon? Or Hannibal. Or Hannibal. Yes. Or, yeah, but I mean, there is something that you have food that photographs so well, and it's so cool to depict. Um, so even though the film is actually trying to make a political statement about you know consumption and mass production of food and so on, what we take from it is the prettiness, right? I mean, to some extent, we're so in awe of the little s apple snaps and the ties and whatnot that we kind of maybe forget the agenda, if there is any, of, of the film. And it's interesting, you know, why make such a political, politically themed film and then kind of move it back again to prettiness, to some extent. I don't know if, if you had yeah, that kind I of would agree definitely because you know uh, each Anderson's film is a, is a separate universe mm -hmm. especially to me and this one also was co-written with Noah Baumbach the director of Francis Ha maybe uh, well among others of course and uh, they you know both of them have immense I think imagination it's just endless and uh, even if you see Grand Budapest Hotel where you have 
tiny details that you, you know they are you, you can just see them after one viewing that's why you know I'm after fourth I think <laughs> and this is like happens all the time I definitely do to me it's also like a tribute to handcrafted things mm -hmm. like if you want to show that there is some power in you know local food and mm -hmm. everything that's decent you cannot simply throw it in coral like if you want to make it if you want to make your statement more profound you return to this original techniques which are time consuming and labor consuming and which are really expensive but you make your statement clear like this is the way i want my movie to be i prefer things that are handcrafted and i want to follow that line of thinking mm -hmm. oh this is my reading at least no, but this is a, a it seems to be that um, this is uh, Anderson's comment on you can buy an apple pie in a &P, or you can make it yourself or you can buy it from a local store or uh, um, and the same thing is if you, you can have generic animated movie or you can make it yourself with your own hands right so this is again it translates slow into ideology. Film. Slow films. <laughs> but what differs this film from, for example, Big Night or Babette's Feast? Mm -hmm. the, um, the food is not the spectacle, uh, actually. Like, mm -hmm. of course, there is there are a lot of different stuff, but uh, it's not like uh, these shots are very short, and mm -hmm. it's not kind of a feast or uh, drama itself. Like, mm -hmm. we must look for this. Because mm -hmm. we are at this conference, so we look, we look at it. Mm -hmm. For example, if we were at the, if we could view this film like uh, in different circumstances, we could just skip this, this subject. Might, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially after the first viewing, I you know apple snaps I noticed, but the rest probably not really. At first. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I have a question or kind of a general comment about animals. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know the wild thing and the wild animal uh, aspect of this because you know the paradoxical thing that I sense is going on here is that um, wild animals are made anthropomorphic are you know they speak they handle they have schemes domestic animals do not um, so there is this divide, and um, my question for you would be, you know, is this a paradox, or what do you think does it bring to the conversation, also conversation about food and food industry? We don't eat foxes, so they can talk. If chicken talked, you know, we wouldn't eat them, or dogs, dogs right, we wouldn't eat them, right? So is it... Yeah, but the thing is, you know, the, the, the dogs are here on the same level as, as chickens. In fact, in, in, as far as this presentation goes, right? Mm -hmm. So, so is they belong to the worm of three bees. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 we so measure we, their usefulness, right? I mean, this, this pragmatic usefulness for the people, right? Dogs guard and chickens will eat, and foxes are like on the other side of the fence. So they can be our foe, right? Yeah, but on the other hand, you know, if you, if, if you look at the film, uh, how representation works, these are precisely the ones that resemble humans in this film, right? Um, clothing, etc., etc., etc. So, paradoxically, the white thing seems to become who we really are. Um, like, this was kind of, you know, the kind of thinking that I was foot thinking. <laughs> And also what is uh, significant for me, uh, this was the scene with the wolf. There is yes. not something, and it's not anthropomorphic anymore, mm -hmm. and they do not share a language, they can't communicate in fact, only in gestures. Yes. And they seem to be baffled by this situation, right? What a beautiful creature, Mr. Fox says, yes. like he was something else. Mm -hmm. So it was a Does it English? Or <laughs> <laughs> or but it's interesting that it's a lone wolf and all the other animals, wild animals, are family creatures. Yeah. And he's at the distance and he never approaches them. He's not part of the narrative, right? He's just an, an element that they can compare themselves to, right? But here we've got the guys that talk and they've got their own families and they've got their own responsibilities and duties, right? So that's yeah, the wolf right. seems to be kind of at the edge of representation, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somewhere out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, 
ultimate wild thing. It's not really accessible, right? So, are there any other comments? Has anyone seen a, new, uh, uh, a Princess and the Frog? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Just those who are interested in food, apparently some of you are. Mm -hmm. And then you might want to watch it. This is an uh, animated cartoon mm -hmm. uh, about Louisiana and um, uh, African-American cuisine. And uh, it's also a very interesting uh, movie to watch. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, we've got talking frogs. But they are anthropomorphized, right? Uh, for a different reason. So. so maybe at the end you can tell us about your favorite food movies. Is this this one one of them, like Princess and the Frog? Um, your favorite? Hannibal. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's just because of the aesthetic value. I mean, this is just really amazing. It's how it can actually uh, manipulate your mind into wanting to eat human flesh and it, it's so you know it's, you, it's just when you see it it's it's so tasty right and then you feel the disgust for yourself and thinking that you could ever consider right so this is a for me this is a brilliant tv show because of the this kind of duality on the one hand you've got disgust and then disbelief and that at yourself for the craving it right so this is a, i think in, in, in the context of visual representation um, and I was talking to you about Treme. Mm -hmm. There's this. Uh, there was this TV show, uh, HBO. Um, um, it uh, ended this December about uh, food waste in uh, New Orleans, uh, post Katrina, New Orleans, and uh, lots of lots of jazz and uh, and food. So and again, it's a very interesting uh, TV show uh, from the perspective of you know southern studies and food studies as well. Was it Anishka Holland directing? The, the, the pilot. pilot. Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm like a child. It's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, <laughs> Again, by your own doll, right? Yes, story yes, the yes. New yes. version or the, the, new, the new one? The new one. The new one. I, uh, yeah, I like the Umpalumpas as well. Umpalumpas, yes. <laughs> Would you like to share with us your favorite food movies? <laughs> Or TV shows, for that matter. Or books. Or Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. <laughs> Did you know that there is a Game of Thrones cookbook? I mean, it's pretty amazing, and the recipes are not really that difficult to make. Really. So yes. So yes, the, the, apparently there is some food in Game of Thrones apart from killing. And there is a food blogger. Yes. Polish one from the movie to the kitchen. So yes, yes. She's hugely inspired by mm -hmm. all the movies that she mm -hmm. watches. Uh, then, if you don't have any last chance. Last comments, last questions, because if not, then we can wrap it up and thank our guests very much for coming and for having lovely and insightful comments, and to you for your participation in the viewing and the discussion afterwards. And enjoy the rest of the conference, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.